The News Round on Off The Ball with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. This is News Talk. Hello there, Joe Malloy with you this evening. So GA back in our lives this weekend, opening weekend of the Allianz Hurling League. James e. O'Connor this hour on what to expect over the coming weeks and on into the championship, which is right around the corner. Much unhappiness with the rule changes as well. Hurling people are very clear about this. Don't be meddling. The game is grand. Well, they've meddled and hurling people aren't happy. Keith Wood and Rory O'Connor have their say on line selections, the weekend's interpros and just a one year tag for a long contract. Kind of interesting news today. Chelsea and Tuchel now with two wins against Man City ahead of their Champions League final. Pat Nevin with us after nine. Brian Kerr as well on Manchester United Aston Villa. He was working at that game for us yesterday. And Maria Kinsella will join us as well. Maria, co-chair of the GPS National Executive Committee. Equal funding for inter-county female players announced today. 53106, the text number. We're at Off The Ball on Twitter. You're all very welcome. Richard McCormick, as are you. Hello. How are you, Joe? Very well. Nathan Murphy, evening. Evening, lads. Uh, conspicuous by an absence there. We won't have time this evening to touch on Roy McIlroy's victory last night, his first in some 19 months at Quail Hollow, his third win at Quail Hollow. Uh, cited the work of his new coach, Pete Cowan, is awesome. Still said Michael Bannon is uh, very much part of the team. He's awesome too. Harry Diamond, also op- awesome. And uh, working with Bob Rotella as well. I hadn't realised this. He said this afterwards. Uh, sports psychologist Bob Rotella got a mention. So uh, the McElroy team, Nathan, are suddenly very happy. Well, look at the team he's put behind them. You're one of the most talented, if not the most talented golfer in the world. Things aren't going well. What do you do? Do you put your head down and just try and scrap through it yourself? Or do you get the very best that there is out there? And it's brilliantly refreshing to see that McElroy has said, you know, I don't have all the answers here. Because the noise around McElroy is unlike any other golfer. There's constantly questions about Michael Bannon, about Harry Diamond get rid, get rid, get rid. He's kept faith with them and he's just added any amount of expertise and he has come out of this. Is it a crisis? Is it a slump? I'm not sure it can be any of those things when (laughs) he had three tournaments without a top 10 and we're writing him off for years to come. But there were still, a lot of that was based on Rory and, you know, people are critical of those who write off Rory. A lot of it comes from what he says about himself. He at times does talk himself down. He's very honest and open, maybe a little bit too giving, and we all spend many hours on Golf Weekly reading into what he said, but oh, there's something about Rory in contention. He frustrates the life out of me at times. I'm more critical of him than probably any other sports person, but when he's there competing, and last night was strange because it was so comfortable for so long, mm. but then when it almost was snatched away in 18, he hit that horrible hook almost into the water and nearly blew it. You're just praying that he'll take the right decision which he did and just get over the line and listen golf with Rory McIlroy back competing and contending is a far more exciting place yeah it sure is it just makes the tournament so much more watchable it was interesting a couple of years ago Lee Westwood I don't think Rory liked the comment Lee Westwood said that Mm. McIlroy always has a hook in there when he's under pressure and so proved in 18 Uh, and he played so well I mean it was his irons it's been a long time since he was pin high with so many iron shots which is just a good sign I mean we have uh, held our head in her hands too often when he's almost uh, airmailed greens and gone over the back of them or come up way short and you remember his own frustration I mean you say we get frustrated remember he snapped his club his wedge uh, last year because he knew that for all the work he was doing on a short game it wasn't paying dividend and suddenly last night it was green after green after green and often pin high and you mentioned Harry Diamond as well often criticised McElroy's caddies generally have been criticised because he doesn't want to a vociferous I'm going to boss you around type caddy it's not what he wants so therefore the caddies can sometimes look weak or indecisive but on 18 when he was deciding what to do last night and this is where he had to avoid double bogey to win the hole 18 is a really tough hole he said Harry was awesome out there today especially that decision on the last I was ready to get in there and try and play the ball as it lay with that lob wedge he said let's just take a step back let's think about this where's the best place you're hitting your third from so he calmed me down, he slowed me down a bit and ultimately we made the right decision and I took the drop instead of trying to play that shot out of the hazard. I hit a great third shot onto the green and was able to two-put from there and that's probably a nice uh, moment for Harry Diamond because he has been working away under the general accusation that, well, you just weren't Rory's mate, so not much more than that. So he kind of stepped up a little bit there last night, which was good. Well, he is Rory's mate, uh, first off, which is why he got the job. But he's also a bloody good golfer in his own right. So it's not like one of us just rocking up there and giving Rory advice. He knows the game inside out. But the reason he got the job 
was because Rory doesn't want a Steve Williams type who's going to challenge him. What he wants is somebody he feels comfortable with, not just on the course, but around the course as well. But it did feel like a big moment for Harry Diamond because, as we say, the noise around Rory is that there's questions about every part of his game, every part of his life. Is he working hard enough? Is he fully committed to the game? Is he, you know, is golf his number one priority? He'd say himself at times, maybe it's not. And the caddy comes under huge scrutiny. And it, it, it was probably the biggest moment of Harry Diamond's caddying career last night because we heard every moment of that conversation. And at first it looked as though Rory got lucky when he didn't go in the water. Then the more they went and zoomed in on the lie, you thought, hmm, this may not be as uh, clear cut as it seemed, trying to chip out onto the fairway. At one stage they were looking at maybe trying to hit it up towards uh, where all the fans were situated and maybe get a free drop up there. And then Harry Diamond just quietly said, he could take a drop. Mm. And almost instantly it just clicked in Rory's head. And as you would assume Rory McIlroy should have got there eventually himself, but he's frazzled. He hasn't won in 18 months. He knows this is, he should have closed that tournament out comfortably. You're looking at that leaderboard and there's no real recognizable names putting huge pressure on him. No, Gary Woodland, the US Open champion, was in the mix for a while, but like, Rory was the class player in that field. And then to hit such a horrible tee shot in 18, that this would have been, he would have been hammered today. We would be talking about Rory McIlroy, everything we'd seen for the previous seven holes, forgotten about what is going on that he could make such a horrible mistake. So, yeah, Harry Diamond had a big moment. And all around, it's very exciting. Like, looking at some of the stats, and listen, we'll save the big ones for Golf Weekly later in the week, but he was top three in the field in driving distance, greens and regulation, scrambling, and strokes gain putting, which is every part of your game to perfection, which is the influence of Pete Cowan and also the influence of Brad Faxon. We chained Larry in Golf Weekly last week and I think he was just off the course with playing with Rory earlier that day and with Brad Faxon. And yeah. you know, Brad Faxon is the putting guru and if Rory's swing is in any sort of shape, if he puts well, he's always going to be close. Yeah, for sure. And it seemed I fully appreciated at Quail Hollow basically he puts better there than anywhere. He is that is his best putting course. Now he's got Kiwa for the USPGA in a couple of weeks where he won by eight shots in 2012 when he won the USPGA then. So, hey, look, it's a, he is streaky and Rory gets hot and he gets cold. Given the condensed nature of the golfing season now, it's a good time of the year to start getting hot. And uh, Bob Bertel is interesting as well to be uh, working. Bob Bertel, of course, famous for golf's not a game of perfect. A sports psychologist worked with a lot of the best. So um, that's really it's interesting, uh, positive. isn't it, Bertel and Cowan? Because a feeling around Rory would be that I'm sure he, he talks to Paul Rick Harrington a lot and Harrington obviously would have spent time with Pete Cowan and a lot of time with Bob Rotella and both of those would have been seen not really McElroy type people that yeah. they overcomplicate what for Rory for almost all of his life has been a simple game that you're asking too much he's getting into his own head where he just needs to be free but obviously again you've got to admire him he's thought I need to find a way out of this mini slump and he's gone and he's gone to the best. Well, I think the Rotella thing is really positive. I mean, I'm not in Rory's head, I don't know, but I think there was beginning to become a problem with pressure. And the Masters is such a huge thing. And I, I'm glad to see he's getting help in that department. And, um, well, Bob Rotella literally wrote the book, so you can't get much uh, better name than that, really. I presume if uh, Rotella's had all the success he's had, he's, he's well worth talking to. So that's really interesting. Uh, there's a text in from Bob. Harry Diamond earned his stripes by giving McElroy the uh, option for that second shot in 18. Kept his cool, subtly managed his man, stopped him from playing the crazy shot out of the rough. Yeah, that's uh, pretty much what we were saying. So we're not going to do a piece on McElroy this evening, but just wanted to mention that at the top of the show. We'll do Golf Weekly on uh, Wednesday. Rich, we should start the news round on Off the Ball and News Talk with thanks to Gillette. We don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette made it what matters. And I suppose... Um, your first story, part of a general theme of good news, hopefully, on the COVID front. By the way, you just gave away eight minutes for free when you have a Patreon. <laughs> that, like, whoever, well, you, whoever is your you, business you, manager needs sacking. <laughs> you see, you might think that that's uh, eight minutes of, of goodness that we'll never get back, but our podcast will be about two hours long on Thursday, so <laughs> yeah. it'll all be fine, Richie. In, in proportional terms, Richie, that was nothing. And, but even still oh no I, I know you, know. you, you got to give them just a little taste and got to make them all uh, more that, that is, that's the top line stuff just for the people who tune in on the Sunday night we'll go deep on this Richie don't worry but this is uh, look we love our FM listeners as well do we not yep <laughs> not as much uh, as the ones who give us 3 a month <laughs> so 
let's uh, get going on this then because I think we're, we're against time all evening. Busy yeah. weekend of sport. James O'Connor is going to join us this hour, then the lads on rugby after eight o'clock. Uh, as I was saying, good news hopefully on the uh, COVID team. Catherine Martin was on yeah. News Talk today. She was, yeah, and she's filled hopes that this year's All-Ireland Championships and, of course, other sporting events could play out with some fans present this summer. The Minister for Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gaeltacht, Sport and Media said this evening she wants to bring forward trials of both indoor and outdoor events, not just of a sporting nature, of course. Earlier this month, indeed, on the show, Tijak Miel Martin said he would like to see stadiums welcoming back fans in July. But Minister Martin said this evening that she's keen for test events to start as early as June. And on the hard shoulder in News Talk, she was asked why Leinster's request host their own test events were turned down. And because we weren't in a, a position to do it uh, at that time and we, we have the return to, to, to sport report um, that uh, Minister Chambers um, has been working on as well and that was done by the, the FAI, the IRFU and, and the GAA so um, that, that's the report that is with the Department of Health and we're just fine-tuning that now taking into account um, the vaccinations. Okay, so hopefully that can happen in June. Uh, Tyke Furlong then, Rich. Yeah, new one-year contract with Leinster and the IRFU, funded entirely by the latter. The 28-year-old was due to be out of contract at the end of this season. Furlong was last week named on the Lions squad to tour South Africa, having started all three tests in 2017. And the Wexford native is glad of his newfound contract certainty. No, we'll go ahead again now next year again. And um, yeah, look, it's really exciting, both groups. Um, you know, we believe they're there to, to compete at the business end of the season. and. Um, you know, we had a tough year in patches this year, but I suppose everyone has a bit of faith that, you know, we can, you know, really, really compete and uh, it's exciting to be part of. Kind of an interesting one this, Nathan. A one-year deal for 28-year-old Tyke Furlong. You would have thought, well, at a minimum, a contract to bring him up to and including the World Cup would be the obvious, if not a three-year deal, given his importance. This, uh, we'll talk about it later on with Rory O'Connor and Keith Wood. This feels maybe like a touch of a placeholder contract look we can't quite give you what you want this year maybe and stick with it for a year and we'll sit down and revisit this next year is that your reading things or what do you make of it god i'd love to know the inner workings of this there's obviously a reason it was the last contract to do and there's a risk for tyke furlong because he plays in the position and has seen that injuries can happen quite quickly but yeah. the reward potentially for tyke furlong if he gets through the next year if he has a sensational lines tour and he's the best tight head in the world a year out from a World Cup where you're going to be Ireland's main man and you're out of contract, you have got the IRFU in a very good position. Either to stay in Ireland or in a position where, if you wanted, I guess you could do the Johnny Sexton and say, well, I'm going to take the payday in France. You can't afford me, but you also can't afford to drop me. Mm. What do you you're make of it, Rich? Yeah. Well, No, no, I, I, yeah. I, I, I think there's uh, something... Uh, unusual about this just a one year deal and even I thought the press release was kind of a bit sober and joyless considering you've just locked yeah, it, was, it was just a little bit yeah look this has happened and this is funded by the IRFU and it's a one year thing and we're happy yeah. and Tig's happy and end of press release whereas this should have been like big big news this is deli we're delighted this is great we've secured him for years into the future I don't know Rich um, your your thoughts on it yeah, it was like the quotes from both David Nusifora and Tyke Furlong in the press release were pretty perfunctory and just, you know, standard. This is what has happened and we'll go and play in the new year. But there's like, there's something in what Nathan's mentioning there about the potential to go to France while invoking the, I guess we'll call it the Johnny Saxon rule, whereby you're deemed as being too important to be dropped essentially just because you're playing abroad. But if it is the case that the IRFU and other associations that just you know bear that in mind too as regards to other countries um, are not able to pay the money that other associations or other clubs and other territories would be able to play then you know hovering this idea this sort of Damocles over them that they can't play international rugby if they move abroad it suddenly becomes something of unfair in terms of employment law because you're like if Ty Furlong wanted to move abroad tomorrow, he could probably pick up a better deal in France. And I think that's going to be the case given what COVID has done to the rugby world uh, for the next three, four, five years, maybe. Um, to be saying that you're going to drop players specifically because they want to seek out the best deal for themselves and their families now seems a little bit off mm -hmm. if we're going to be progressing forward, whereby the RFU are you know, operating with caution. Sexton's deal is the same. Sexton's deal is a one-year deal for the same reason. I'd imagine at a more local uh, level, Leo Cullen at Leinster's one-year deal is is a pretty similar situation whereby they can't exactly offer him the four or five year deal that maybe he might want or well, they might want. Sorry, I think 
Leo Cullen asked for it to be one year, which was kind of interesting. Yeah. Stuart Lancaster took a longer one. And with Sexton, I guess it's age. I mean, they'd be foolish. Anyone would be foolish to offer Sexton a longer deal. I think if Tyke Furlong was willing to sign up for three, four years, the IRFU would jump at it. I suspect he gets, or has, I have no inside info, but I just, I, I would guess yeah, he's had on, yeah, very good offers. And I would think the IRFU, because of COVID, can't quite meet a level he might like. And so maybe there's a degree of luck stick with us for this year, things will return to normal next year and then we'll sort out a nice three-year deal then. And I wouldn't think he wants to go. I think he lo loves Leinster and loves playing for Ireland. So I think maybe they both said, OK, let's just uh, yeah. rubber stamp the next year and then we'll really have to sit down. That'd be my guess. Yeah, I'd, be, I'd go along with Nathan on that one. I'd say, given how late this has been agreed, it's probably a case whereby the terms involved were ones that they couldn't guarantee two, three years in the future. So they've yeah. just said, listen, we'll give you this for now. We'll see how we are in 12 months' time and we'll sit you down and give you a two, three-year deal then. Or, you know, his injury profile could have played a part in this as well because he has missed a hell of a chunk of time over the course of the last two years. So, like, there are many, many factors that we're not privy to yeah. that led to this contract. It's also the right thing for the IRFU to do, you would have to say, in that, I, I don't know what the top salary is at the moment, maybe 350, 400 grand. You could get double that in France. Considering... The IRFU are in a position where, you know, staff are working shortened weeks. We know they've taken a massive financial hit because of COVID. Are they going to have to actually rethink that policy? Because does it make financial sense for the union to be paying Tyke Furlong €400,000 when they could actually let him go, spread that money around and still have him playing for Ireland if they just change their rules? Yeah, I think the highest mm -hmm. earners now are creeping up on six at this stage as well. Right. Yeah. Jesus. Should have but played rugby, Nathan. You should have played rugby. Yeah. So, well, look, I think Tyke Furlong's going to be on the show on Wednesday, so we're wasting a lot of time here. We'll just ask him then. <laughs> Can we get his paycheck? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, look forward to him saying none of, I look forward to him saying none of your damn business, which is absolutely his right as well. Yeah. Now, some, uh, well, long overdue news for uh, female inter-county players. Uh, equal funding, in short, to their male counterparts. Yeah, the Gaelic Players Association has welcomed that announcement of an increase in funding for female inter-county players. Under the current model, €1,200 Euro is received by male players, while female players get just €400. Minister of State for Sport Jack Chambers today announced funding of €1,200 Euro for both male and female players. That represents a €1.7 million Euro increase from the previous figure of 700000 Yeah, we'll talk to Maria Kinsella later on. This was such a no-brainer. I mean, this has nothing to do before we get the old usual text messages in about gate receipts or TV money or the revenue generated by the various different sports, male or female. This was just government money. This was just Department of Sports saying to the men, you're going to get this much and to the women, you're only going to get this much. So that's why they had to rectify that and uh, double quick as well. So Maria Kinsella will join us later on. There is uh, football on the season, Rich. Yeah, and uh, some some consequence as well. Fulham's return to the championship could be confirmed tonight. Defeat to Burnley at Craven College will see Scott Parker's side condemned to relegation after just a single season back in the top flight. A Burnley win also would secure their Premier League status and kickoff is at eight. Scant Irish involvement in this one tonight. Jimmy Dunn on the bench for Burnley. Now, a different kind of one-year contract, one that Manchester United fans are happy with. Yeah, Manchester United striker Edinson Gavani signing a new one-year deal with the club. His new deal keeps him at Old Trafford until June of 2022. Cavani's emerged as a key player for United this season. He scored 15 goals in 35 games. Mm. Three of those have come in his last four matches. Occasionally a signing like this happens, Nathan. I mean, United fans will remember Henrik Larsson very favourably, I think, as well, came in, made a huge impact. Mm. Cavani has absolutely surpassed expectations. There was such a sense of, ugh, when he was signed, and this is washed-up player, what's he going to do? But you just see his craft, I think, is the best word when he plays, and the movement, even for the goal yesterday, just so alive. And, you know, the run dictated where the cross went. I know you were doing the game with Brian Kerr. He is just a touch of class, Cavani. He is. I had a late-night row with somebody about Cavani recently where I think he's brilliant. And I think his movement is exceptional. Once, once, once again, once again, I just think we need to say to your wife that she has our sympathies, <laughs> and it, you know, no, she 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 reeled out all the stats about Cavani. <laughs> okay, uh, I I think he's brilliant. I can absolutely understand why Manchester United fans love him, but oh, he's a cult hero. Manchester United do not need a cult hero number nine. They need a number nine who can score twenty five goals a season. Mm. Now maybe they'll go and get that during the summer. Maybe they go and they buy Harry Kane or Erling Haaland or Kylian Mbappe. But I don't think Edinson Cavani is a striker who's going to bring them closer to the Premier League title. 
But if the deal is right and he wants to stay and the money is right, it's an absolute no-brainer yeah. uh, to keep him in what he can pass on as well. You would hope that all those players around him are, as you say, learning from that movement. It's how much do you get out of him next season? It doesn't look as though he's a player you can start in the biggest games against the other sides in the top six. It doesn't look as though he's going to have enough of an impact in them. But yeah. listen, for you know, 20, 25 minutes, half an hour at the end when things are tight, why not? No, that's fair. I agree with that. He's not bridging the gap to winning the league. No, no. And that's where the focus will come on the Glazers during the summer. The players who can do that are going to cost them a lot of money. I, mm. I thought the most exciting thing about Manchester United coming into the season was the potential of Rashford, Greenwood and Martial. And, you know, could they score 60 Premier League goals between them? That hasn't happened. They've mm. all had moments. Greenwood's obviously in one at the moment. But you look at Martial still and think it's probably never really going to happen for him at the uh, Premier League at this stage yeah. to be that guy. So, I'd like... That is a huge area they need to sign in, and we know there's other issues as well. But listen, Cavani is somebody. Every time you see him, he plays with a good attitude. He, you know, t- just the, the quality of that run yesterday, the quality of the ball from Rashford as mm. well. It was mm. it was brilliant. It probably again, Rashford, uh, Cavani's done it a lot this season. He's covered up probably some issues for Manchester United from a, a two one where they were under a bit of pressure, having gone behind as well in the game to suddenly winning three one, and everyone's delighted with life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is that sense with Martial. It's just starting to feel like. Uh, it's not going to happen and I think they were reluctant to let him go for a long time because there was the worry he would come back and haunt them two years later after blossoming but um, it's really hard to see it at the moment so uh, a few last stories Rich the league started I mentioned in the hurling bad injury for Tip yeah Tipperary hurler Brian O'Mara is to miss the remainder of the county's Allianz hurling league campaign the Holy Cross Ballycal club man suffered a fractured arm in Saturday's drone game with Limerick Tip have confirmed that O'Mara will be out for between four and six weeks Antrim caused the big shock of the weekend uh, the late points from Kieran Clark and Neil McManus saw the Saffron's edge out Clare in Division 1 Group B on a scoreline of 121 to 22 points. Elsewhere, all out of finals, Waterford were no match for Cork in Group A. Alan Connolly scored two goals for the Rebels as they won out 522 to 127. Elsewhere, yesterday, Wexford hammered Leash 417 to 10 points at Chadwick's Wexford Park. James e. O'Connor with us very shortly this hour. Uh, meanwhile, it ain't Fiji, but Ireland have games. <laughs> Yeah, it's a slightly less glamorous summer for Ireland's rugby players. Japan are going to visit the Aviva on July 3rd and the USA are going to be at the Lansdowne Road venue a week later. The Games replace Ireland's planned tour of Fiji, which of course was scrapped on account of the pandemic. And before you go, free to air Six Nations for the next three years looks uh, pretty much nailed on now. Yeah, tournament organisers say they've agreed the principles of a joint bid between Virgin Media and RTE for the broadcast rights of the men's, women's and under-20 tournaments. It had been feared the broadcasting would be put behind a paywall following heavy investment from private equity firm CBC Capital Partners. However, an unprecedented joint bid by Virgin and RTE has been confirmed by Six Nations Management in what would be, they say, a multi-year deal. Yeah, so uh, it's the uh, free-to-air gang ganging up on the paywall gang. The... UK rights were meant to be announced in advance of this, but it seems there's real tussles between BBC and ITV versus Sky Sports, interestingly. So that's not going to be as clear cut. I brought this up with Miguel Martin last week, Nathan. Somebody asked me, by the way, why I didn't declare an interest. I felt the fact that I, it was on national television uh, meant I wasn't <laughs> trying to hide it, but uh, maybe I nice should have. I, I don't know. <laughs> well, I, felt... I, I, was, I was just, I'm, I'm wondering about your, yourself and Ty Furlong's uh, contract conversation should be interesting on both sides, Jill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he has them over a barrel, I don't. <laughs> But uh, this now gives, uh, uh, sorry, the point I was going to make was I laid it all out and talked about rugby in Australia and how it had been hurt and, you know, so important, etc. And Neil Martin on Taoiseach just said, oh, I agree with you. I agree with you. As if, you know, government here are a bit powerless to sort this situation. This now gives them three years, I would think, to put Ireland, England in the Six Nations uh, on a similarly, similarly protected level to everything from Cheltenham to every Republic of Ireland soccer match to the big GAA days to Ireland in the Rugby World Cup. You know, all these other things which you would think are very comparable yeah. with Six Nations games. Uh, they now have three years to maybe think about that and do it once and for all. I would say the Irish, if you are going to fight tooth and nail yeah. against that because yeah. as much as Michal Martin, like everybody else, wants to see it in free to air, he also knows that if it comes to bailing out the IRFU from the government or getting the TV companies to do it, it's far more favourable for most people that the TV companies scrap it out themselves. Yeah, though. The last two decades, as uh, successful as it gets, and it's all been mm. in either RT or Virgin, they've kept each other honest. Can you give us a bit of insight, Joe? Who's getting what games? I have no insight, actually. No, zilch. Zilch, zilch, zilch. So um, uh, we'll see. But at least it's free to air for the next three years anyway. So, uh, fellas, thank you. Richie, cheers. Cheers, lads. Nathan Murphy, thanks very much. Thanks, Joe.
We've got James O'Connor next. We'll have uh, Rugby with Keith Wood and Rory O'Connor after 8 o'clock. We'll be talking with Maria Kinsella as well about the funding announcement before 9. Football show. Uh, we'll turn to Pat Nevin and Brian Kerr. Lots going on this weekend. Not least uh, Big Sam finally, finally heads downwards.